Tonight we're continuing in the third chapter of Ephesians. This will be our 33rd lesson. We'll be covering verse 9. And the ministry of Paul, he sheds light on what God is doing in Christ Jesus and what and the foundations of it of that doing. And as we go through this, you'll see there's a lot of things we'll come across that, that don't mesh with the contemporary Christian emphasis. It's, it's it has sort of a strange sound to it. If you've if you've been around that the contemporary scene, these things all sound kind of strange. And that's because they're, they can't be mixed with it. They just don't fit in. Wherever this circumstance is found, where what people are hearing makes things like this strange, they're hearing the wrong thing. Amen. We don't have to probe into it, try and figure it out. If what God is doing doesn't blend with what's being said, then really it's is wrong, completely wrong. Now Paul is raised up to be, by his own testimony, he was ordained to be a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity, 1 Timothy 2, 7 says, faith and verity or faith and truth. In other words, Paul's job is to, he's ministry of things that can't be shaken. They can't be altered or changed. They don't change with times. They don't change with circumstances. They don't grow old or wear out. That's, to, that's what he's preaching. And he was ordained and he did, he did an excellent job, didn't he? Carrying out his ministry. Now, in his day, already there had been what, a, what I call a hodgepodge of teaching that it was beginning to surface already, distracting teaching, philosophies, and people like uh, my grandfather used to say, like a blind hog rooting for an acre, and they're trying to find something, but they're just wandering about. You kind of sense this. I hear, I hear a lot of preachers, I kind of sense they're just kind of, Grope, blind men groping feet, trying to feel their way through life, and they, you don't get that when you read Paul. There's sort of a solidity in what he says. Once you see it, just kind of as firm and grounds you. He's introducing a message that clarifies. He's not just clarifying the message, he's doing that too, but He's introducing a message that clarifies or sheds light. The message sheds light on everything else God has seen. The message is the gospel, and it sheds light on everything else that's been said by God and all circumstances of life as well. He's informing those in Christ of what actually is happening in salvation. A lot of people... Poor souls, they don't know anything's happening. Yeah, right. They thought it all happened mm -hmm. yeah. back there somewhere. When they were young or when they were baptized, it all happened. Mm -hmm. Now we're settled down to the dullness of life. But that's not the way it really is at all. Jesus is called... The light of men. <laughs> quite, quite a statement, isn't it? Amen. The light of men. And it said that it shined into the darkness. Right, that, that's what Paul's doing. He's taking the gospel, which is the exposition of Christ, and he is shining it into the darkness. 
So, well, you know what happens. You've seen it yourself. You suddenly see it shed light on things. Maybe you've kind of held a certain view for a long time, and all of a sudden, boy, you. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you haven't held a view for a long time. Suddenly, you see it's the right view. What is that? That's the light. Amen. That's the shining. It's, the, it's called the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Second, Second Corinthians 4 4. The light, <laughs> think about it. It sort of aggravates you, doesn't it? Some people say the gospel doesn't need to be preached to the church, and it's the light yeah. of the. <laughs> yeah, it you, you can't get arrive at a place in life where you don't need light. There's not a, a phase of the life in Christ of where light becomes obsolete. Mm -hmm. The light of the gospel of Christ. And you're changed as you, by the Holy Spirit, as you behold the light of the knowledge of the, the light of the glory of God. That's, as you look at that, then the Holy Spirit takes that radiating light and changes you yes, to be conformed to Christ's image. I'm showing you here that Paul is a minister of light. He illuminated. That's been the driving compulsion of my life is to help people to see, at least see what I've seen. And if anyone can help me see more, I'm all for that too. Paul will now acknowledge that his assignment from the glorified Christ involved making people see. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Making, not talking about God making him see. Right. Ultimately, it is, so we understand that, but it's mm -hmm. to Paul's ministry. Paul's going to make men see. Yeah. Make all men see. Yeah. Yeah, what, a, what, a, what a statement this is. This, this is just not oratory. So, verse 9, here's how it reads And to make all men see. What is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ? Amen. To make all men see. Now this is the immediate verse talked what he's helping them see is the unsearchable riches of Christ. <laughs> yes, but if you could ever see it, it corrects a lot of things. Ignorance causes a lot of problems in the kingdom of God. Ignorance causes a lot of problems, and seeing solves a lot of problems. So let's look at this to make all men see. To make, <laughs> somebody says, oh, well, you can't make people do anything. To make all men see. Make them see. Make them see. Other versions read, to bring to light. NIV says to make plain. Holman Bible says to shed light for all. Darby says to enlighten all with the knowledge of what is. Mrs. Bible says to bring out into the open. Amplified Bible says to enlighten all men and make plain to them. See, God doesn't want people ignorant. Amen. Not about what he's done. Actually, the phrase, make all men see, that's translated from one word, one single word. And the word means to give light, to shine, to enlighten, light up, illumine, bring to light, render evident, cause something to exist, and thus come to light and become clear to all. In other words, there's something going on right now that can't be seen and can't be comprehended amen. unless somebody opens it up. We're not talking about possibilities now. We're talking about something that is being done. Now it's being done. God is doing it now. It's happening now. But if you don't see it, 
it doesn't affect you. In the kingdom of God, what you don't understand, you can't maintain, you can't hold it. If you have something you don't understand, it wiggles right over your hand and gets away from you. You can't keep it, you can't keep it. When you understand it, ah, you got a grip on it. Yeah. Paul says, I'm, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm, I'm showing you what is in the background, you might say. I'm showing you what God's doing and why he's doing it and who he's doing it to and means he's doing it through. I'm, I'm expounding that to you. Now, he's explained in this chapter why he was called of God. And there's just some interesting phrases that are used up to this point. In verse 2, he refers to his work as a dispensation of God's grace. Dispensing of See, grace does something. Grace does something. It's productive. Grace is like an engine or a vehicle. It does something. In verse 3, he said, God revealed in the mystery. Now, just these words are all very big words. Something that nobody could see it. For thousands of years, nobody could see it. All of a sudden, God revealed it to him. He said, I have knowledge in the mystery. I know about the mystery. I know what people don't understand. I do understand. People can't make heads or tails out of what God's doing. I can. It's been revealed to me. I see it. He has knowledge in the divine mystery. It's something that formerly was hidden. Now it's revealed. And it was revealed primarily through Paul. And he's passing it on as... Of course, that's what you're supposed to do. When God gives you something, pass, you're supposed to pass it on because you're part of a body. Yeah. You don't stand by yourself. Mm -hmm. You can't live by yourself. No man lives unto himself. Just can't do it. Then Paul says it was revealed by the Spirit. And the Spirit searches the deep things of God. <laughs> It's the Holy Spirit. See, this is how profound it is. God has to give it to the Spirit who dwells in you, then the Spirit who searches all the deep things. Like he, he can probe into profound realities that nobody could possibly see or understand. He can probe into them and then make you know them. I'm showing you what the level of things that we've been talking about here in Ephesians. This had to do with the promise of in Christ by the gospel. So the gospel has a promise in it, in Christ. It's not, a, it's not academically apparent. You can't like, this is the gospel. One, two, three, you read, there it is. So oh, there's something in the gospel that can't be seen that way. It's got to be opened up. By God, through the Holy Spirit, in Christ, by the gospel. It's got to be opened up. And people who can't live godly, this is why they can't. You can say, well, they love sin and they're not looking at Christ. This is, this is all true, but this isn't at the root. At the root of the matter is they can't see. Now, maybe they've been blinded by God. That's, that's, that's possible. He's been made a minister according to the gift of grace. See how ever he's, he traced everything back to God. You see, very, very methodically. Verse, that was verse 7. Verse 8 says he was to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. So this is, this is the context on which our text is, is found. He has explained why he was called. It, it ponders, ponders, to make all men see. So do you think a man like Paul who's been charged to make all men see, you think he has any kind of interest in the passing fads of the religious world? You think he cares what the latest chorus is? Do you? You think he searches the best-selling book list? <laughs> a person like this isn't interested in things like that. 
people who are interested in things like that, they don't have anything. That's why they that's why they're taken up with this with the fans and fans and passing fans. God was doing, and it yeah. would overshadow everything That's else right. that was going on. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Because, see, the eternal life is knowing God. So already, all, that means that not knowing, this is a liability. That's right. <laughs> so when Paul would find people that determined that they didn't want to see, he would leave them. That's right. Amen. Which is the way it's supposed to be. This is the way Jesus was, too. Uh -huh. If people didn't want him, he just moved to the next town. That's what he did, Brother Gene. This list of things that you have here, Paul is saying in this section of the letter, it strikes me that some of the people that I've associated with in the past, they would read and accept on the surface what Paul's saying here. But if they met him in person and heard him speak like this, they'd think he was a wacko. I know. Yeah, they'd think he was crazy off his rocker. They wouldn't have anything to do with him. That's Absolutely right. Absolutely nothing to do with a man who spoke that way about God. Remember how Felix said, Thou art mad. Thy much learning has yeah. made you mad. Yeah. There are religious people who would think oh, that way about Paul. I know it. If they met him in person, they would think that way because he spoke about receiving yeah. something directly from God. Yeah. Uh, we know it because they don't receive what he says. Not really. No, they don't give themselves to it. It's a great multitude of people who are satisfied. Just like in Jesus' day, yeah. the multitudes were satisfied with their religious systems. That's right. Yes. And that's what prevented them from seeing. It kept yes. them busy enough that they thought they were religious. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now the, the people who came to Jesus that were not satisfied, they they saw. That's right. Mm -hmm. now, now you see here all these things that he said he'd been given to do to make men see. Mm -hmm. So this tells you something about God. Mm -hmm. This tells you God intends for his people to understand. Amen. Amen. Yeah. God doesn't have a salvation that makes spiritual dummies. There isn't any such thing as that. And wherever there's a person or a group that claims identity with God that over the long haul, they kind of, they're spiritual idiots. I hate to be so crude, but that's what it is. These people are out of the will of God, and it's questionable whether they're in Christ. Because this is not the thing God is doing. God is opening the eyes of the understand. He sends an apostle to make men see. And if they don't see somewhere, they've ignored what God is doing. Because what he is doing is making all men see. Amen. See, this is why when you find yourself, the things are making sense to you. And your vision is enlarging. This is your confirmation that God's working in you because this is what God is doing. This is what salvation is. It's knowing God. Not about God. Knowing God. And you become intelligent in God. And God's manners and God's purposes and this sort of thing. Brother Gibbon, you said earlier, now God wants man to know what he's doing. Now one day all men will know. They will know. But he wants some to profit from that. Now. That's right. That's right. All right, now this being the case, what I just said, this is why it's foolish for the church to adapt its message to those who remain outside the body of Christ. Yeah. This is why that is so wrong. Yeah. We have an example of what the church is to hear. is found in the epistles. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a group where this is actually happening where the people are actually finding out what God is doing in Christ. And this is a small group, the same thing. This is one of the weaknesses. Of the church, the church, home church movement is a burgeoning movement. It's, there's a lot of home churches. But I can guarantee you, no matter which house church you go to, you will find, number one, a casual atmosphere so it's not too challenging, and you will find that, that there's not really a lot of spiritual insight. It, it, we're a house church, so it's just we're not anti-house church. I'm just saying that it's weak, too. It's more akin to like a 4-H club. This... Uh, 
this is not the kind of thing God is doing. God is not promoting friendship. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what he's doing. Now, there is a place of pivotal, what I call pivotal knowledge. Now, what I mean by that phrase is these are principal facts that support for sound reasoning. They support sound reasoning. They enable a person to think properly and productively and acceptably before God. And there is, the church is a place where this kind of knowledge is to be dispensed. The principal person in this, in this scheme is Christ Jesus himself, and the primary works are the ones he accomplished. Amen. Knowing God has to do with being knowledgeable of this, of the, in this area. Eternal life is knowing God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Now, when it comes to knowing God, his works are an index to his person. Amen. Men may talk about God being omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent, and he is. But that's not the way the apostles talked about him. They'd mention this once in a while. They would tell you what he did than what he's doing. Psalmist would say, his tender mercies are over all his works. So what's that mean? That means if you see his works right, you'll be illuminated concerning his mercy. They say, the, he is holy in all of his works. Psalms 145, 17. So if you see what God does and you see it right, you'll be impressed with how holy God is. Now when it says, be ye holy, oh, now this changes how you view that entirely. It's when Peter preached that day of Pentecost, if you want to summarize what he preached, Acts 2.11 says it was the wonderful works of God. Yeah. Remember, what I said is the index to knowing God is God's works, what God has done. What God has done tells who he is. On an elemental basis, his power and Godhead are made known in creation, which is one of as his first terrestrial work. <laughs> and it tells you something about God. But that creation was nothing mm -hmm. compared to the new creation. Amen. God, God is known by what he has done, what he is, his works. So the, and the gospel is frequently called the gospel of God. Now Paul says, I've been appointed an apostle to make all men see. <clears throat> now this statement perfectly correlates with Jesus' commission to, to Paul. His commission was to open men's eyes. See, so it perfectly, perfectly correlates with what he was doing to, to do. And those included in the object, here it says the eyes that all make all men see. Yeah. It was to open the eyes in Acts 26. Now, the people included in that purpose, the, the, the all that he's going to make men see, is identified in Acts 9.15. It's the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So that pretty well, pretty well takes everybody in. Yeah. The Gentiles, kings, children of Israel, Acts 9.15. The things that open the eyes of men or make them see are contained in the gospel of Christ. It's not in Proverbs. Proverbs won't open your eyes. Ecclesiastes sure won't. For sure the Song of Solomon won't. It won't open your eyes. It's the gospel that opens the eyes. That doesn't mean you neglect these books. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you want your eyes open, you got to get beyond. Yeah. Amen. You have to get beyond that. Amen. Some people think if they just read a few Proverbs every day, it'll teach them how to live, and they'll still be yeah. dumb about God. Yeah. See, the purpose God to make men, all men see isn't make them see what they're supposed to do. 
That, that wasn't his commission. You don't have to be an apostle to do that. You can be Apollos and do that. You can be Philip and do that. To make all men see has to do with what God's doing. Amen. Because if eternal life is knowing God, then it's absurd to think about you could know, you have eternal life without knowing what God's doing. Amen. That's part of knowing God. Open their eyes. Once a person perceives this purpose, which members a join the Jews and Gentiles Jews together, their vocabulary changes. <laughs> it changes from I to us. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it does. Jesus taught men to pray. Our yeah. Father, give us this day I did it. Forgive us our trespasses. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. See. <laughs> You're not the main person. Mm -hmm. What is God doing? God is, this is an age of God's group work. Mm -hmm. His group work is greater in glory than his individual work. Mm -hmm. Well, you've got to see this. Amen. Now, what brings greater glory to God? A single man like Samson? defeating the Midianites or a single boy like David defeating Goliath? Does that glorify God more? Or what about a body of individuals held together by what each individual supplies being built together for a temple of God? Now which one of those brings God the most glory? Is it a hero and a champion? Or is it a body of individuals from different backgrounds and different capacities and different personalities and coming from different places and all working together for a con which gives God the greater glory? And this kind of church is virtually unknown in our time. In this world, one can hardly find an individual congregation is perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment, even though that is a divine requirement, 1 Corinthians 1.10. Of any size, of any, of any size. Some of us have preached for congregations as small as 9, 10, 12, and they had divisions. They weren't any more united than the ones of 1,000 or 2,000. But think what God's doing. He's united a vast multitude that no man can number, Amen. taken from different backgrounds, different genders, different social status, and they're thinking the same way, yeah. working for the same cause. See, that's what God's doing. That's what God's doing. He's getting ready for the grand gathering when he's going to bring together everything on earth and everything in heaven, going to unite it in one. That's where God's headed and he started out by get the ones from earth are going to be united before they join the ones in heaven. All right, I make all men. So what do you want all men to see, Paul? I'm going to make all men see what, what is, is the fellowship of the mystery. You see, it's just the language is even strange. You know, when you, you, if you're a Bible reader, it's not strange. But I mean, to the average churchman, Fellowship of the mystery. I mean, it doesn't even sound. It doesn't even sound intelligent. It sounds like garbage, gobbledygook. Yeah. I'm sure if you just go up to say that, most brethren, you <laughs> probably say, "Where did you get that from?" I know. <laughs> See, it has a strange sound. It does. It wasn't strange to Paul, and it wasn't strange to people who heard Paul, but it's strange today because they're not hearing the message. Now, I want to show how different translations handle this. Some of them, they just miss the point completely. The administration of the mystery. That's not right. The plan of the mystery. That's, that's a little bit right. The dispensation of the mystery, not right. The ordering of the secret. Some truth there. 
the way this mystery works, that, that, that's pretty good, actually. God's secret plan, too vague. Inner workings of the mystery, that, that's, that has some insight. That God is a savior of the Gentiles, too. That's true, but it's just too simplistic. How is, how is to be carried out the trusteeship of the secret? If, well, if you could unravel it, that, that says something, as we'll see. The plan for his secret truth, what God has created all of this in the first place, has been doing in secret behind the scenes, and what is the plan regarding the Gentiles and provided for the salvation of men? Now, I, give, I gave you those to show you that even expert translators come across things that are very, very difficult because <laughs> you have to have understanding. You have to have understanding. Now, the word fellowship in this text is the word taken from the word koinonia, and there's still people still use just the koinonia fellowship, so forth. The word means the fellowship, associate, it's community, joint participation, sharing that one has in anything, participation. That's the sense of the, how this word is used. The mystery is made known, but how men participate in the mystery, that's the thing that Paul's making known. How do they become a part of what God's doing. Amen. That's the point. Yeah. Amen. Not just that God is doing this and God is doing that, that you're a part of what God is doing. Because in order to be saved, that's got to happen. Amen. You got to be in his household. And you have to partake of the divine nature. Partake of Christ and a lot of these other matters. The same word is sometimes is translated dispensation in other passages, which has to do with how it's administrated, mm -hmm. how it's carried out. But that's not the meaning <laughs> here as I understand it. The meaning here is that as I proclaim this mystery, it results in the people whose eyes are open mm -hmm. participating in what God is doing being a part of it. Not joining God in the doing of it, but God's doing it in them yeah. is the idea. Yeah. Now this is the facet of religion that's only found in the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. To my understanding, no other God has the people participate in what he is doing. Does that make any difference what whether it's the heathen gods or the Muslim gods or who, none of these other gods call the people into participation with what they're doing. Yeah. We are laborers together with God, co-workers with God. For a variety of people, not a certain, not a certain class of people. These, these people come from all kind of classes and all kind of backgrounds. And they're all involved in what God is doing. The secret to it, of course, is that they themselves are being conformed to the image of God's Son. So they themselves are becoming more and more and more like the God that's working. Amen. Which means God's not going to work for good in people that don't know him. He's just not going to fall out People read everything works together for good. I don't understand why this happened. This is just a very much of a mystery. I can't under comprehend it, but I know it's going to work together for good. Well, I understand there's a sense in which that's true, but that's not the way we should talk. We should have a little further insight. We should be able to see. Oh, I can see how this this opened up this part <laughs> of my life and that part. This showed me something about God I'd somehow had forgotten that God uh, can be stirred up as well as uh, made pleased. So no other religion results in the people participating. Now the mysteriousness of this 
purpose, the mystery. Make all men see the mystery. The, the mysterious part is how it's being carried out. That's the part that was, that was hidden. God had hinted he was going to make all things new. He said, I make all things new. That was a prophet said that. I make all things new. I make a new heavens and a new earth. And I'll give them a new heart. And I'll give them a new spirit. And I'll write my laws in their heart. So what he was going to do, that was made known. But how he was going to do it, that's the part that was concealed. The prophet says, search what person and what manner of person and times. is how he was going to do it. They didn't know when... Who is, who is this person through whom God's going to do this, and when is it going to happen? See, the how it was done, that's the part. But that's the part that you've got to come to know. I understand that God's ways are mysterious and past finding out, but that's not true of the ones he's revealed. His path is in the sea, that's true. That means you just got to be close to up. To, to follow him. <laughs> if you're one of the following a distance and his path's in the sea, which what he says it is, mm -hmm. then the, the path is if you're way back there someplace, it's gone by the time right. by the time you get up to a certain place you can't see. You gotta be right on right on the tail end of the boat. Yeah, right. If you're gonna if you're gonna follow his path. It's actually uh, some people say, well, this, this all sounds like this removes our personal rights and makes slaves out of us. Well, actually, this gives us a lot of rights yes, amen. and makes us free. Yes. That's what it, when, you, when you know, when, the, when you are fellowshipping in the midst, you're part of it. You know God and your knowledge is increasing, see? Amen. You're freer than you've ever been before. Haven't you sensed it? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You're freer than you've ever been before. You're more satisfied than you ever been before. No That's right. Yeah. Even the psalmist, he didn't know how this was going to happen. He said, I'll be satisfied when I awake with his likeness. You see, he had a sense of, but he didn't know how it was going to be done. But Scripture tells us, we know how it's going to be done. When Jesus comes, we're going to be changed to be like him as he is. So we, we, the details have been given to us how this thing's being worked out. And once you see it and you understand it, you aggressively enter into the work of preparation. Amen. Amen. You prepare yourself for what's coming. The saved are brought into the fellowship of the mystery by means of a shared message. Remember now that it's the message that causes all this to happen. It's not answering the problems. It's not, it's not even prayers. It's a message that makes all of this, all of this happen. The church is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. So Jesus takes his fullness, and by means of a message, he pours himself into the church to the various members. See? And, and none of himself is depleted when he does it, but he distributes, speaking rather crudely, he distributes himself to the church. Uh, yeah. So if you want to find Jesus, you've got to come in contact with some of his people. Right. It's got to happen. As though this was not enough, some of the members of the body into whom he's pouring the fullness he had a rich background of hearing a lot from God and having a lot of preparation. And some of the members didn't have anything given to them. No prophet, no law. How's God going to, you mean God's going to amalgamate those two groups? So radically different? Yeah, that's what he does in salvation, just to show you how great God is. That's what he's doing. Now these two groups merge together. They have a common faith. They have a common salvation. They possess one hope of their calling. And they have a common intercessor. That is a great work. You know, some people in the same family can't get together. They can't, they can't get together. It's just, this is... Uniting people is a, is a God work, if ever there was one. Yeah, but this is also um, kind of points out uh, 
the um, how distracting these false doctrines can be. That like, well, uh, but the but the Jews are going to be called with a different gospel. Yeah, <laughs> see, it, 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 it's like so. In other words, what Paul's saying here isn't really true. Then, yeah, but see, it is. He's with the same gospel, the same spirit, That's the right. same Christ is going to join together Amen. these two. Uh, these two nations that were, it would be impossible That's for right. them to do they, they were at enmity against That's one right. another. Now, to show you how God works in this, he's going to give a special advantage to the Gentiles. They were last, so they could be first mm -hmm. when it comes to knowing about the mystery. Yeah. <laughs> That's how God works. So here's the Gentiles, didn't have a prophet, didn't have a promise. They want to send to them with the word, things are coming, well, you're going to be blessed. And lo and behold, he gives them the apostle that seemed to know the most. Amen. That's God for you. Amen. <laughs> so if you feel like you're on the bottom of the totem pole, yeah. <laughs> rejoice. Yeah. God can put you right at the top. This is how God is. Uh -huh. Amen. He takes the one that the Christians feared the most and made him the... <laughs> Most abundant laborer. Put a lot in Paul, didn't they? Catch everybody That's right. Up. You can see that, yeah. Gadget, yeah. that the Gentiles were lacked a lot of advantages, but look what they gained in the apostle given to them. Now I've been appointed to make all men see the mystery. That from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. The beginning of the world, it takes you back to Genesis 1 1. That's the point at which the environment for humanity was created. What does it mean it was kept secret from the beginning of the world? It means when God made the world, he had this secret mm -hmm. yeah. in mind. Amen. He made the world to fit in. To this secret. It's, he's going to ultimately he's going to recreate it, you understand. But the world was like the arena mm -hmm. in which this would all be worked out. An arena which it looked like these things could not possibly be accomplished in this arena. Yeah. Where death reigned and sin reigned and the God of the world is Satan. But the purpose is being worked out in that environment. He was hid, now think what this says, hid in God. Yeah, that's a challenging expression, isn't it? Hid in God. Some of the various versions say hidden in God or kept in God, kept hidden for ages by God, hid up in God, secretly planned, concealed in the mind of God, hidden away in God, concealed, hidden in his mind, it means that what God has purposed or planned cannot be discovered yeah, yeah. until he divulges it mm -hmm. is hidden. Amen. You can't find it by searching. Now keep in mind, Paul's affirming that he is now making known what has been hidden in God. It wasn't that God thought about it then put it on the shelf. It's always been a part of God. Yeah. Everything he do, had, has done was with this purpose in mind. Something hidden in God is hidden from men. But not from God. <laughs> Although he didn't make his intentions known to men, all of his words and works were an expression of this purpose. But it just, they couldn't, Amen. it couldn't be figured out. Yeah. Till later, after after the gospel opened this thing, then we look back and oh yeah, we can see a lot of the types and figures and things like this. Now, so far the Naamathite he knew about this. This, this. this is about a contemporary of Abraham. This they didn't have a Bible. It's amazing what these men knew, but. Here's what he said. He didn't know how to apply it right. I understand. Here's what he said. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? Can you diagnose what God has done and figure out what his plan is? 
Well, even angels couldn't do this. Right. Even angels couldn't do this. What's hidden in God is means just exactly that. He's got to reveal. He's got to make it known. And it had the mystery had to do with what God had purposed in Himself. So, the the mystery or the involved humanity was not based on what God saw men would do. God purposed it completely independent of a consideration of humanity. He purposed it in Himself, where it was hidden. It's not God's purpose isn't a reaction. It's a purpose. Well, I know you know this, but it's, I'd love to say it anyway. Amen. God does not reveal it. If God does not reveal it, it can't be known. So men may get in a room and talk about it and discuss it, and, but if God doesn't reveal it, mm-hmm. and there are some things God hasn't revealed, they belong to God. Yeah. Uh-huh. Some things he's said that you just can't mm-hmm. plummet so you can study and Discuss, but you can't find it. He's got to reveal it himself. When this fact is known and embraced, it makes perfect sense to deny self. We're talking about God now. We're not not talking about some man. God purposed it in himself. He's hid it from the world. Now he's divulged it. Now, it makes perfect sense to deny myself and become a part of what God is, God is doing. It makes perfect sense to crucify the flesh. It make, mm-hmm. makes absolutely perfect sense to do it. Amen. makes perfect sense to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That makes perfect sense. Once you see this, this makes perfect sense. Amen. Well, you say, well, why don't people do it? Because they don't see this. That's right. <laughs> That's why. They don't think of God as having a purpose. They think their purposes are what God uh-huh. is trying to help them along with their purposes. But this isn't it at all. God has a purpose. And he brings us to participate in that purpose. We are the center of his purpose. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then he throws this statement in. Who created all things by Jesus Christ? Looks like it. What did he? What did he say that for? Well, there's a reason why he said that. Mm-hmm. Now, back in the council chambers of eternity, Jesus agreed to come to earth. Will I come to the will of God? Mm-hmm. He's a lamb slain for the foundation of the earth. He was privy to this purpose. Mm-hmm. Doesn't it make perfect sense then that the person who knows the purpose would create? Yeah. Uh huh. Amen. You see the logic here. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Makes perfect sense then that he would make the world so that God could place people, mm-hmm. particular locations, yeah. to be ordered. In other words, to the earth, mm-hmm. for certain periods of time, certain places, so they might seek the Lord. Mm-hmm. He'll make the earth so the divinity and eternal power and divinity of Christ could be. Mm-hmm. Seen it? Yes, that's why God. That's why Jesus created. He created it with this purpose mm-hmm. in mind. Say, well, well, that's just not a philosophical statement. If this is true, mm-hmm. that God created the world with this purpose in mind, mm-hmm. then anyone living in the world mm-hmm. can theoretically have access to this purpose. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Amen. Nobody can say this was never intended for me. Mm-hmm. There'll be nobody yeah, amen. be able to say that in eternity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nobody will be able to say Jesus didn't die for me. Mm-hmm. Jesus didn't defeat sin for me. Mm-hmm. Even reprobates will not be able mm-hmm. to say this. Mm-hmm. They will not. Because you see, this was made. He created all things mm-hmm. by Jesus Christ and Everything that's created, which is all you've got access to, mm-hmm. as far as your body's concerned, it was all made with this purpose in mind. Mm-hmm. Amen. Now you add to that that God has revealed the purpose, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. then he's revealed it to a kindred man mm-hmm. and sent him to tell us about the purpose while we're in a world that was made to be the stage for that purpose. You see, it all. 
it all fits together marvelously so that we don't have to go out into the desert or go out someplace mm -hmm. to find it. It's, this is tailored to work in this present evil world. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Until the prepar preparatory work is done. Mm -hmm. And then it won't work anymore. And the world's going to be passed away. Mm -hmm. So the, if anyone's going to prepare mm -hmm. to meet God, it's got to be done in this world yep. by seeing the mystery. Yes, amen. amen. That's how the preparation is made. Mm -hmm. So let me read that verse again. Where have I? Uh, and make all men, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Now that admittedly we admit <coughs> this will not be a popular message mm -hmm. because it speaks as though men's problems are of no interest to God. Mm -hmm. Well this isn't, this isn't altogether true but their interest, his interest in the difficulties of humanity is toward those that are in the fold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. those that are in Christ Amen. and then sometimes he just gives them s extra strength in their difficulties yeah, he, yeah. Does, he doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. obliterate the difficulties <laughs> right. sometimes, sometimes he just gives them extra strength because one of the things he's demonstrated in salvation how he can sustain a person that looks like they're not sustainable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that's, if that's true that he mm -hmm. does this mm -hmm. that he makes them stand mm -hmm or keeps them from falling, then that postulates that all of their problems aren't going to be solved. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. those statements wouldn't mean anything. Yeah, that's right. See? Wouldn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he says it, now we know something about God. God's not interested in just you just having a smooth, smooth sailing all the way. Mm -hmm. As his, because grace is in this, and grace presumes waves and earthquakes and tsunami waves. Right. It presumes a hostile environment. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's what God's doing. He's doing. Not only is God changing men and bringing them to participate in what he's doing, he's doing it in an environment that looks like you can't do it in that environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. And Satan can't do a thing about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. He stuck this right under Satan's nose. Mm -hmm. Satan can't do a thing about it. Mm -hmm. And if you have a word you'd like to add tonight? Yeah, Brother Gavin, the, um, some people may think, well, this, is, this doesn't really seem like it's that great of a thing. I mean, after all, he, he took, took away our sins, so how hard it would be to make two nations come together. Yeah. But he's showing that there isn't a person that you can meet anywhere in the whole world that isn't a candidate for the gospel. That's right. <laughs> God is able to save to the uttermost everyone who comes yeah. to him. So just opens the door. That's right. I mean, you may think, well, my neighbor's too hard. He's not too hard that God can't save him. So you preach to him. That's right. <laughs> you live it out in front of him. This and, is yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. This is why you don't have to adapt the message. It's yeah. already uh, adapted. Amen. It's a pre-adapted message. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, son. Go ahead, this, who created all things by Jesus Christ wasn't just tacked on the end oh, there. Oh, no. Now, you brought this up, and uh, I've been doing a lot of studying on this, and it's, it's ironic that you brought it up, but that now in the first, uh, in the Gospel of John, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, he makes a point of this. That's right. Because my text comes out, and he makes a point of this, that Jesus is intricately, Involved in the very, very beginning. That's right. Made as the way. word, and but for a reason though. Oh yeah. Because see, salvation is going to come through him, so he's involved in this in a very particular and very personal way. Because mm -hmm. he's going to be the life and light of man. So he starts at the very beginning. Amen. And he so this is not just tacked on here. No. This is the Spirit's way of connecting all That's all right. these things right onto the record. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, yeah. Sister June. Yeah, um, I had some thoughts along those same lines. This who created all things by Jesus Christ. This whole book, this entire book, if you read through it, it's 
it's Jesus, 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 <laughs> the Christ, Amen. Jesus, by him, through him, mm-hmm. promised, according to the, the, this, this book is opening up yeah. the, yeah. what God is doing in Christ Amen. Jesus Amen. from Amen. the very inception, but it's through Jesus that these things are made known. There are the things that are revealed to us about Jesus. Amen. The things that Jesus is working in us. Mm-hmm. The things Jesus has done. The fact that, that he was, he's a revelator mm-hmm. in, in, in these things. When in the beginning, I kept thinking that God did something when he created. And then he said, let there be light yeah. so that it could be known. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That's whenever you begin to see what God was doing. Amen. Well, he, Jesus is the light of the Amen. world. That's right. And the light of God is seen in Christ. That's right. It, no Christ, no light. It's it's like God didn't say, let there be light yet without Jesus. Amen. And the things even in the past, the things that we see best and most clearly are the things that most precisely foretell or relate to the coming of the Christ. And so this this uh, matter and the fellowship, this is a this is a, a light that is internalized. It yeah. Is, Amen. Know, it's a it it's kinda of like lighting a candle. You know, the fire is away from the candle. But then whenever the light is put on the candle, the candle illumines too. Yeah, yeah. So that the, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. You just the candle of the Lord. Yeah, Amen. That's enough now. It's, You're preaching my sermon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to be quiet because there's a lot more to say. <laughs> At any rate. And the Lord will light my candle. <laughs> <laughs> He'll make you a lit candle. That's yeah. right. Amen. Amen. Just gonna yes, end what Sister June was saying because that, that's same along along the same lines I was thinking too. Mm-hmm. Like in Colossians, he says all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge yeah. are hid in him. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So it is inaccessible to any man on earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, utterly inaccessible. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a difference between the head knowledge of Scripture and the understanding of Scripture. Oh, you amen. Can be a good Pharisee mm-hmm. and be able to point to Moses and tell him exactly what Moses said. Yeah, mm-hmm. and miss. The Lord's Christ. That's comes. right. Mm-hmm. So Miss that prophet. Jesus is the only one who can open up the scriptures and eliminate. Open up the book. So mm-hmm. it, it makes perfect sense. So when he created, mm-hmm. created all things, who is most qualified? That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. To represent mm-hmm. God in a way that's absolutely perfect other than Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Amen. So I, 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 I'm... All night I've been mindful of that text when he says, I will open my mouth in parables yeah. <laughs> and other things hidden yeah. from the foundation of the world. Brother, he's come. Yeah. Yeah. And he's now opening up the Amen. mind of God. Amen. So Amen. That we can not just know, but participate in it. Amen. Amen. Sister Barb. You made mention of the works uh, bearing witness to the Lord himself, God's works opening up his person. I was considering that it's the works through the through the gospel and Jesus Christ that do this because back in the old covenant there was the index given that the Israelites saw the works of God but Moses saw his ways yeah. which is indication that seeing the works for them didn't profit them at that yeah. point amen it was only when the light of Christ then brought forth these works in the illumination that he also brought that's when things were beginning to be made manifest amen mm-hmm. yeah one other thing um you know God keeping a secret isn't a novelty. You know, some people can keep secrets mm-hmm. from people, but he keeps a secret until it becomes That's advantageous right. for mm-hmm. his purpose. That's right. And then yeah. he divulged. He's gonna, he was going to divulge it the whole time, yeah. but he just kept a secret That's until right. men would be able to um, understand it to where he would be That's able to right. open it up. Otherwise, it would really have been no purpose. That's right. If you want to know what sin did to the human race, it took 4,000 yes. years for God to get him ready there. <laughs> Amen. Yes, Do you want to really know what sin did? Mm-hmm. That's what it did. Yeah. All right, we'll have a closing word of prayer.